so uh, thank you, thank you all for uh, for being here. I'm Etienne. I'm a postdoc here at the Centre de Recherche en Éthique. Um, so my talk is entitled "Propaganda and the Epistemic Value of Democracy." Um, so uh, this is the uh, this is a fairly new subject of uh, inquiry for me. So I'm actually really interested to. Uh, to uh, hear what you think about it. Uh, so um, I'll try to keep the presentation uh, short so that we have enough time for uh, Andre's comments and then, and then uh, the, the Q&A. So let me start by uh, a few introductory remarks. Uh, so what, what, what's the aim of the paper? Uh, generally, some of you may have read it. So uh, the aim it broadly conceived is to contribute to the non-ideal theory of uh, epistemic democracy. And is to reflect on uh, the gap that exists between the epistemic value of actual and ideal democracies, and uh, also on ways to achieve epistemic democracy as uh, an ideal. So, um, let me uh, present the main claim of the article. So, uh, I argue that propaganda threatens the epistemic value of uh, existing liberal democracy. That's what I try to argue in the three first part of the paper. And a, rel a related claim that's fairly more exploratory um, uh, that I explore in the uh, last two sections of the, of the paper is that uh, preventive strategies uh, are more likely to be effective against uh, propaganda than uh, what I call deliberative strategies. So uh, if I move to the, uh, the outline of uh, the talk, so in the first uh, section I, I uh, simply try to uh, define propaganda. So propaganda is not an easy concept to define, uh, as uh, I mentioned in the paper, because it often functions as some sort of rhetorical weapon, as an accusation rather than as a, an, an analytical tool. Uh, then uh, in the second section of the paper I try to uh, show that there are reasons to believe that uh, propaganda can be effective in some uh, context. Then uh, in the third section, which is a fairly important uh, section, uh, I try to relate the, the contemporary literature on propaganda with uh, the, the literature on the epistemic value of democracy and to uh, make the claim that propaganda can threaten uh, the, uh, the value of democracy. So the uh, fourth uh, and fifth part of the paper are a little, more, are a little bit more exploratory, as I mentioned. Uh, then I turn to kind of strategies that we may uh, try to use in order to kind of fight the effects of propaganda. So in the fourth section, I consider uh, what I call uh, deliberative strategies, uh, democratic deliberation, as, uh, as a, a potential strategy to uh, fight the effects of propaganda. In the fifth part of the paper, then uh, I turn to preventive strategies. I also try to give uh, at least one example of a preventive strategy that is currently discussed, uh, which is currently discussed in Germany. I'll come back, uh, I'll come back to it. So um, in the paper, I discuss, uh, I, I spent some time discussing Jason Stanley, who just published a, a book on propaganda's definition of propaganda. So uh, there were a lot of um, criticisms of his uh, definition of, of propaganda. I don't really want to get too deep into this, uh, this point in the presentation. I'm happy to come back uh, to it in the Q&A if you have questions about it. Uh, but I propose an alternative uh, decision, uh, sorry, definition of uh, propaganda by relying on the work of a philosopher called Randall Marlin. And I propose the following definition of propaganda. I don't know if you can actually see behind me. I hope so. So I define propaganda as the organized attempt through public speeches or the production of media content to trigger emotions, elicit desires, or uh, shape belief in a large audience in ways that circumvent an individual's adequately informed and reflective judgment. That's a fairly long definition, but propaganda is a complex phenomenon. And, and what I also propose to do in uh, the paper, which we don't find in, uh, in Marlin's work is to go ahead it's okay yeah, it's a game Don't it's, worry. yeah it's <laughs> everybody settled in yeah. all right uh so um Beyond this kind of broad definition of propaganda, I also try to distinguish between uh, what I call ideal types of uh, propaganda. Um, I, I propose to distinguish between uh, those ideal, ideal types because I think it helps us to understand that uh, different kinds of propaganda can have different kind of aims. Uh, so uh, I consider effective propaganda to be the organized attempt to trigger emotions, cognitive propaganda uh, as the organized attempt to elicit desires, and uh, cognitive propaganda as the organized attempt to uh, shape belief, uh, most importantly descriptive beliefs rather than normative beliefs. Uh, but um, those, of course, are ideal types. I think that when we have real cases of propaganda, uh, we can find that they're often hybrid. It's rare that uh, a case of propaganda is going to fit only in one of these categories. Uh, an example of that would be, uh, let's say, a racist poster who uh, portrays or depicts um, a targeted group of the population as uh, being animal-like or insect-like. Insect 
uh, think about classic instances of uh, propaganda. I, I take it that such a poster uh, would both try at the same time simultaneously, try to trigger disgust, try to kind of elicit the desire to get rid of uh, this, uh, the members of this targeted group, but also to propagate the belief uh, the descriptive belief that uh, people who belong to uh, this group are uh, quite simply inferior to uh, other members of the, the general uh, population. So that's, uh, that's for the, uh, the definition of uh, propaganda. Now, uh, do we actually have reason to, um, to think that propaganda is effective? So um, I think there are historical examples of, uh, of uh, propaganda that we all can think of. Uh, but in the paper, I chose to focus on uh, three cases that are fairly more recent. Um, so. Uh, Yanagizawa Drott argues that uh, we have reason to believe that uh, hateful radio broadcasts uh, led to significant increase, uh, a significant increase of violence um, during the Rwanda genocide. Uh, the, two other, the two other cases I consider are cases of what I would, I would call cognitive propaganda, so cases of propaganda that mainly aim to, uh, to propagate certain beliefs, to shape beliefs. So uh, Mielowski argued, an associate argued that uh, climate change denial campaigns uh, are fairly efficient in, in shaping the beliefs uh, of uh, individuals, uh, they, they propagate the idea that uh, either that climate change is a hoax or that at least that uh, scientists are not to be trusted. And they also argue that there's a correlation between uh, distrust in scientists and uh, the tendency to believe that climate change is uh, not real. Uh, and Cole and Associates argue that um, the Bush administration, at the time it was trying to justify the American uh, invasion of uh, Iraq, successfully pro propagated the idea that uh, Saddam Hussein was closely working uh, with Al Qaeda at the time, and also uh, the belief that uh, there was uh, that that uh, we stockpiles of uh, weapons of mass destruction. You probably remember this from the media. Uh, had been found uh, in uh, Iraq, and uh, both claims uh, were false. So. These are the, the cases of uh, what I take to be effective propaganda. But what, how does propaganda work? That's, that's a, an important piece of the puzzle for me, an interesting of the, of the puzzle. Uh, how is it that it's effective? So in the paper, I try to uh, consider uh, two explanations of how propaganda can be effective. Uh, I'll maybe spend a little bit less time on Stanley because this part of the paper is not very innovative. I basically summarize uh, some of Stanley's argumentation. But in the case of uh, Levy's analysis of fake news, uh, to my knowledge, nobody kind of tried yet to relate the study of fake news to, uh, to study of propaganda. So uh, Stanley's linguistic analysis uh, of the, uh, let's start with uh, Stanley's linguistic analysis of the at issue and not at issue content of uh, iterances. Um, so I take it that the main conclusion that uh, we can draw uh, from, from, Stanley's, uh, from Stanley's argument is that a, a skillful political speaker uh, is going to be able to make repeated political, problematic political associations while making sure that these uh, problematic associations remain very difficult to, uh, to challenge and they remain very difficult to challenge because they're not at issue. So an example that uh, Stanley gives uh, in his book, a, a kind of an interesting example is that uh, if you imagine a political speaker starting his political speech by declaring gravely, there are Muslims among us, uh, then there's, uh, there's reason to believe that what this political speaker is actually trying to do is uh, to try to convince the population that Muslims represent some sort of threat to uh, national security. But in this case, uh, this, uh, this kind of implicit uh, statement is implicit claim is extremely uh, difficult to challenge uh, because it's not it's simply not been uh, uttered. Uh, Stanley also considered uh, considers other cases where the not at issue content is uttered uh, but is kind of not uh, presented as the main claim of a proposition. I'll, I'll leave it there uh, uh, for, for the presentation, but again, I'm happy to come back to it. Uh, and uh, Neil Levy's analysis of uh, fake news, so I must mention that I take fake news to be a case of cognitive propaganda, so a type of propaganda that mainly aims to shape uh, belief, <coughs> propagate specific belief. Uh, so relying on uh, some psychological fin findings, Levy uh, argues that the repetition of a claim results in higher levels of acceptance. Uh, it increases what Levy, uh, Levy calls uh, processing fluency and uh, Higher processing fluency leads to higher levels of uh, acceptance. So psychologists has known this phenomenon as the truth effect. Uh, Levy also argues that uh, we acquire beliefs from fictional sources, uh, even if we know that they are fictional, and even if we are warned in advance uh, that uh, they contain false claims. So. 
Uh, the, final, uh, the final point that uh, Levy tried to make, relying on these uh, psychological uh, findings, and which I use in the article, is that there's some sort of disconnection between source knowledge and object knowledge over time. So, for example, if you read right now a fake news article, and uh, you know that uh, the content of his article is false because the article is a fake news article, um, you may uh, now be led to reject it, but uh, Levy argues that over time, uh, you may remember the content of fake news article without remembering that this content, that you read this content in a fake news article. So you re only remember the content of, of this article, forget that it was a fake news article that contained these claims, and then be led uh, to, to accept these, uh, these beliefs. So uh, that's for the definition of propaganda and the, the question of the effectiveness. The effectiveness now, uh, an important of the papers, the third part, because even if you think that propaganda uh, is a phenomenon, even if you think that uh, propaganda can be effective, uh, how exactly does it, does it threaten the epistemic value of democracy? So Stanley is fairly confident in his book, declares that obviously propaganda threatens the epistemic value of democracy. And I found that this claim uh, is not really warranted of the book. I, I, for me, it's not, it's not uh, obvious that propaganda is uh, a threat to the uh, epistemic value of democracy. So I, need a, I think that a little bit of work needs to be done to kind of show this. That's what I tried to do in the uh, third part of the, of the paper. So in a nutshell, this is really uh, in a nutshell. I tried to argue that uh, two claims in this, in this section. The first claim is that cognitive propaganda increases the likelihood that citizens will hold false beliefs. Um, I mainly focus on, on cognitive propaganda in, in the article. And then the second claim, uh, which, which is important, is that holding false belief is likely to impair an individual's capacity to form sound a posteriori normative judgment. So just think about the kind of political judgments that a, a citizen may be uh, led to make on a daily basis. We should vote for candidate X. Uh, we should uh, open the borders or close the borders. Uh, so I take this to be a posteriori normative uh, judgment in the position to kind of like really abstract normative, uh, a priori normative principle. So an example of that uh, that I give of the paper is that uh, falsely believing that the presence of migrants and uh, refugees in our country uh, has led to increased crime rates. This is uh, a fake news story that has been circulating a lot uh, in the last year. Will hamper our reasoning if the task at hand is to determine if we should vote for the candidate who wants to close borders or for the candidate who argues that we have a moral duty to accept uh, more uh, refugees. So uh, uh, an example of a fact that it's important to know to know that it's false uh, in order to, to make a sound a normative uh, judgment. Uh, now, um, some of you might think that the challenge posed by pro propaganda, especially cognitive propaganda, um, is not really uh, is not news, nothing new under the sun here. Uh, after all, there are some political scientists and economists that have been arguing uh, that voters are not very enlightened in the first place. That uh, the, uh, for example, Ka Brian Kaplan, Ilya Samin, and Jason Brennan all argue that the epistemic value of democracy is fairly weak uh, because um, the average uh, voter's political knowledge is, is fairly low. Uh, but uh, I try to distinguish in the paper so uh, the argument from ignorance and uh, what I take to be the challenge posed by uh, cognitive propaganda. Uh, because I think that what a cognitive propaganda uh, uh, disseminates is false beliefs and not ignorant. Uh, and I take it that uh, falsely believing that X is not the case is a distinct epistemic state than uh, not knowing whether or not uh, X is the case. Uh, one reason I'm, I'm inclined to make this distinction is that uh, false beliefs tend to rule out Socratic ignorance. So the simple uh, a simple situation in which you would know that you do not know. Um, but um, ignorance does not necessarily rule, rule out uh, Socratic ignorance. So kind of to, to see the political implications of this distinction, imagine, let's say, voter one uh, who gives great importance uh, great, great importance to foreign policy proposals of uh, presidential candidates, but knows that he's not very knowledgeable, uh, knowledgeable about um, about the foreign policy proposals of uh, those two candidates. So uh, voter one may decide to not base his vote uh, on uh, on the policy, uh, the foreign policy programs of the candidate simply because he doesn't know them. And then contrast uh, voter one with voter B, uh, which also uh, gives great importance to uh, to uh, foreign policy and his political choices, um, but falsely believe that uh, presidential candidate A. Uh, defends, uh, I don't know, certain, a specific uh, foreign policy program that this candidate does not really defend. Um, 
if he happens to really hate uh, these, uh, these foreign policy proposals that are not really defended by a specific candidate, then he may be tempted to uh, base his choice on this uh, misinformation and then to make uh, a choice that would be poorly justified. So that's one way in which I try to, to uh, distinguish the challenge posed by cognitive propaganda uh, from the argument from ignorance. A second way that uh, I try to do this in the paper is that uh, the, the knowledge affected by propaganda, I take the knowledge affected by propaganda uh, to be more relevant to the ability to pass a politically competent vote uh, than at least uh, some knowledge that is measured by political um, surveys, five minutes, thanks. Um, so, um, Elen uh, Landmark argued in response to, Kep to Kaplan's claim about political ignorance that uh, sometimes uh, the use of political surveys to measure uh, the, the knowledge of individual voters is quite, uh, is quite elitist. Uh, sometimes political surveys measure things like uh, do voters know or not how many senators there are per U.S. state, and the idea that it's unclear actually that knowing that um, is relevant to the ability to pass a politically, uh, pol uh, politically competent vote. But uh, I take it that the, the, um, the uh, knowledge that is uh, kind of undermined by uh, certain instances of cognitive propaganda uh, is relevant to the ability to pass a politically competent uh, vote. So I try to give examples of uh, true belief that may be undermined uh, by, uh, by uh, cognitive propaganda or fake news a story that I, I think to be important to pass a politically competent vote. So climate change is uh, happening. New immigrants do not have a significant impact on crime rates. Uh, and the Pope did not endorse Donald Trump, so uh, the last example may uh, make you smile. The idea that the Pope uh, endorsed Donald Trump is the most circulated fake news story of 2016. Uh, imagine what it might mean for somebody who has a strong, strong uh, Catholic commitments um, to learn that the Pope uh, endorsed uh, Donald Trump. So. Um, that's for the second part. I'll try to hurry up a little bit for the last part. Um, so the, uh, the last parts of the paper are a little bit more ex ex uh, exploratory. Um, if you agree with me that propaganda uh, poses a threat to, um, to the uh, epistemic value of democracy, you might be inclined to wonder what kind of strategy we may use to kind of fight uh, this effect. Uh, and you may be inclined to think that democratic deliberation itself, having uh, uh, citizens deliberate, uh, is going to uh, kind of counter these effects because they may weed out uh, the good uh, information from the <laughs> bad information that's been propagated by uh, propaganda. Uh, Fishkin and Luskin found that individuals who participate in deliberative polling experiments do gain significant political knowledge uh, over short term and uh, medium uh, term at least. Um, but uh, I try to insist on the fact that studies of uh, deliberative mini publics fo focus on knowledge gains, not on the correction of false belief. Uh, yet there is evidence that convincing individuals to correct their false belief is significantly more difficult, at least more costly, requires definitely more effort, more energy, uh, than teaching them facts that do not contradict the beliefs they already hold. So once again, Levy argues that Corrections rarely, rarely, if ever, eliminate reliance on uh, misinformation. Sometimes corrections even uh, backfire. So one example of this uh, has been found by Nian and Reifler in a 2010 uh, study. Uh, and they found that conservatives who believed that Iraq had uh, weapons of mass destruction stockpiles and were presented with evidence that it did not, in fact, um, that uh, Iraq did not, in fact, have weapons um, of mass destruction uh, stockpiles ended up being more likely to believe uh, that they had that uh, people who were uh, the conservatives who were not presented with uh, this uh, this evidence. So. Uh, I must mention, uh, uh, nonetheless, that uh, this was found by Nian uh, and Reiflin, and I think some uh, reproduction studies have been made, and not everybody argue, argue, are, agrees with these findings. Um, but uh, still, I think that we may have reason to think that uh, deliberation is not likely to uh, help us fight the effects of propaganda. So in the last uh, part of the of the paper, I, I try to consider an alternative strategy. Now, this is not the only uh, this is not the only strategy that we may think of in order to uh, as a strategy to fight the effects of uh, propaganda. Uh, but uh, it's interesting because it's being tested out right now. So, a way to limit individuals' reliance on false belief is uh, to reduce uh, exposure to uh, misinformation ra rather than try to correct the effects of uh, uh, misinformation afterwards. So, my proposal is to limit the dissemination of propaganda which promotes hostility or violence, including the cognitive propaganda which leads individuals to form false belief about cultural, racial, or uh, religious group, such, such uh, for instance, as a fake news article who tried to uh, propagate the idea that uh, uh, higher influx of immigrants do increase um, 
crime rate. So I said that this proposal was being tested right now. Uh, so the 2017, uh, there's a 2017 German bill that has been approved by the German executive branch. It has not yet been approved by uh, the legislature that uh, would allow the government to punish social networking sites that fail to hastily remove illegal content, such as hate speech or uh, defamatory fake news. Uh, so it's a little bit early to uh, try to uh, make a full-fledged case in favor of against this uh, proposal, but I take it that it's fairly interesting uh, and that we should at least uh, pay some, uh, some serious attention to it. I had a last slide, but I think that uh, I'll, I'll stop here in order to maximize uh, the time that we have for, for comments and then for the, for the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Andre, yes. Uh, great, thank you. Thank you very much. I really, really enjoyed the paper. Uh, and it was also a good opportunity for me to actually read Jason Sandy's uh, book that I read in the last three days. Um, and that was also uh, uh, almost as enjoyable as reading your paper. Um, if I read you correctly, the, the argument seems to be propaganda raises a problem for uh, epistemic justifications of democracy in ways that deliberation uh, cannot fix. Um, and the problem specifically is that propaganda sort of impairs, or as you put it, uh, circumvents our ability to form uh, well-informed and uh, well-reflected-upon judgments about the issue at hand. Um, so I have a couple of questions. Uh, I will try to keep my comments as brief as possible. Um, the first one is about the main argument. Um, it seems to me that there is a difference to be made between attempts at uh, circumvent, circumventing or impairing our uh, ability to form beliefs, uh, beliefs or judgments and successful attempts to do that. Because I can see an argument about uh, <coughs> failed attempts uh, of propaganda that actually reinforce our capacity to uh, form uh, mm -hmm. well-reflected uh, attempts. It's sort of like a sort of a million argument that we need, uh, we need bad beliefs out there uh, uh, that we're constantly exposed to in order to um, uh, basically not, not have our ability to form uh, well-formed beliefs uh, stifled in some way. So uh, one thing about the sort of the, 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 the mm -hmm. form of the argument itself. The second one is about Stanley, and it was not clear to me the, the, the work that Stanley is doing in the paper, uh, because you seem to sort of use him a bit at the beginning, uh, but then completely yep. uh, leave to the side the way in which he thinks about pr propaganda. I don't think that the way in which Stanley defines propaganda is particularly convincing. Uh, and I think that the distinction he draws between supporting and yeah. undermining propaganda, uh, positive, negative, etc., have their own problems. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I want to push you a bit on yeah. uh, clarifying your relation to what Stanley is doing, because it's clear what he's doing in the in the second part when you talk about issue, not an issue, questions, and the way in which propaganda incurs uh, our ability to form judgments there. But at the beginning, it's not clear that you need him. Um, and also, second point, uh, it might be interesting to, the, the fact that you don't really use him, I think, um, puts you in a position where you give a very negative uh, picture of propaganda. So you, you seem yeah. to say that, yeah. you know, this, uh, like the definition, your working conception, your working definition seems to be, well, it just impairs judgment. Uh, and that leaves to the side what uh, Stanley is calling civic rhetoric, I think, in the book. Yeah. Uh, so the sort of positive forms of uh, propaganda. So I was wondering where, where, yeah. where you are on, on that particular point. Then on, I think it was really smart, your ideal typing of, of the three ideal types of propaganda, but I do have a problem with that. Um, so uh, one is that I don't think that you, when you speak about cognitive, cognitive, and uh, what's the other one? Um, affective, emotion. it, affective, emotional. I'm not sure whether they're ideal types or functions of propaganda. Okay. And by that I mean I have trouble in seeing how you can have an ideal type of propaganda that is not resorting in a massive way on emotional appeals, mm -hmm. whether you're talking think about propaganda negatively or positively. So I think that even your cognitive case yeah. uh, has to be effective yeah. uh, in, in some respect. So I'm not sure whether even analytically, but so even analytically, so obviously in practice they're going to be mixed, but even analytically whether it makes sense in relation to the concept of propaganda to actually have 
uh, a separate type that is cognitive propaganda, yeah. right? Because obviously, you're, okay, you won't find them in practice, they're sort of ideal types, but at least you have to be able to come up with a, at least a counterfactual example of uh, purely cognitive propaganda, uh, and that just looks weird to me. So something that doesn't uh, yeah. uh, rely on an appeal to emotions, and I think also that doesn't sit very well with your use of Neil Levy's critique. Yeah. Uh, when you say when uh, of, of the naive view of beliefs uh, and his critique of this idea that we can classify uh, mental <laughs> states into beliefs, desires. Uh, what was it? Uh, fantasies and fictions, and that the, these are sort of uh, the, the, it, there's a distinction to be had there, but not a dichotomy. <coughs> yeah. Um, and you seem to endorse that assumption of Neil, Neil uh, of Levy's critique. Yeah. But at the same time, you seem to give it up when you devise the ideal types. See what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'll just keep it there. Uh, the third, uh, the claim that deliberation is not conducive to truth. I don't think that's really exact. So I don't think that the so my view on deliberation is that the the, the record is mixed, yeah. but that doesn't make deliberation yeah. you know totally uh, epistemically ineffective in weeding out even false beliefs. Um, and one example that I had in mind was uh, well obviously we don't, there, there was a host case, case but uh, the way in which um, uh, uh, the the, the um, American public was swayed. Uh, change their views on gay marriage. I think that deliberation, sort of grassrooting deliberation, played an important role in weeding out these false beliefs about, you know, what what a gay couple is, what gay life is, etc. Et the fourth is on prevention. Uh, I don't think that the example you're actually giving is an example of prevention. Okay. Uh, because it doesn't really prevent it from from happening. It's more like a sanctioning uh, example. Um, and obviously, I think there is a huge problem with this because you're, you're basically proposing an anti-democratic tool to fight a, a problem that democracy has in some respect. Uh, and I think that strategies such as these can can backfire. I mean, there's yep. an empirical story to be had there, but I think it's it's it's, it's a shaky uh, solution. And also, I think that it doesn't address the insidious insidious ways in which propaganda can work. Right? There are Muslim among us. I can put that as a statement yeah, yeah. on, on Facebook, and and there's n I mean there's, that's not necessarily hate speech, right? Yeah, uh, that's an assertion that can be totally totally innocent, and th that is specifically the the, 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 the the problem in a way, right? Like if you can take Stanley's distinction between not an issue of issue, that's where the the, the damage happens yeah. the most, right? Yeah. And this insidious forms, and I'm, I'm I'm afraid that these kinds of solutions would not be able to address those uh, insidious forms. And I had like thought about two strategies. One that I think goes in the direction of Juliet's paper, yeah. uh, education. That would have been you know just like have kids learn philosophy in school and uh, be able to spot bad arguments. Uh, and the second one, the one one. Uh, and the second one just just uh, come up with better, more effective forms of positive propaganda. Okay, so a Sanders, sort of Obama, kind of uh, counter propaganda thing, which yeah. would again happen in a sort of a million framework where there's a fight, mm -hmm. but not a silencing, silencing of, of the bad guys. Okay, so, yeah. Five, yeah. five minutes because maximum. Okay, uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for your uh, thorough engagement with, with my with uh, my paper. There's a lot of stuff there. I'll really try to uh, answer kind of step by step. If I forget something, just call me out, and uh, I'll try to. Um, to, uh, to uh, uh, be respond better. So uh, fake attempts, uh, the idea that, uh, the argument that fake attempts uh, at propaganda could actually have some sort of beneficial effect on democracy uh, because uh, it, would, it would lead people to see that, I don't know, some people are trying to propagate false claims, but that we should be, we should be kind of cautious. Um, I mean, possibly, I think that, uh, that, that the evidence that Levy re re relies on uh, makes us think that uh, that would be a little bit like overly optimistic about the, the, the actual individual capacities uh, of, of um, individuals. And the, the interest for me of Levy's analysis, he, he not only, he tries to argue that uh, even people who take themselves, who actually are cognitiv cognitively sophisticated, pay really attention to the kind of sources of the material they're reading, may end up in the end be, uh, be affected uh, in pernicious ways by, by, uh, by um, 
uh, a fake news article. So uh, I think it's it's interesting. It could work, but I'm a bit less optimistic than you about like the possibility that it's that that that, that may happen. Uh, what's the work that uh, Stanley is actually doing in in uh, my article? I'll, I'll try to respond fairly. Uh, quickly, so you saw that in the second section. Uh, the first section makes it look like I'm very critical towards uh, Stanley's stance on propaganda. It's not really the case. Uh, so in the second section, I really rely on in, on uh, his, his uh, philosophy of language and linguistical analysis of that. In the first section, what kind of work it's, it's doing? Quite simply, I just had the feeling that uh, he's the one who just pro kind of proposed uh, propaganda as a, as a subject of inquiry uh, in philosophy right now. So it'd be a little bit difficult to kind of go around his book and make no mention uh, of this book, that, that was the main uh, reason I, I uh, mentioned it. Uh, in, interestingly, you mentioned, um, oh, well, I, uh, I must uh, respond to that also, like, uh, what do I think of uh, civic rhetoric? Uh, you mentioned the idea of counter-propaganda at the end, uh, at the end of, of your comment also, so maybe I'm going to uh, tackle that right now. Um, so I feel that uh, Stanley is not very explicit about the kind of uh, beneficial effects that civic rhetoric could have uh, in his book. Uh, the idea that counter-propaganda can be a kind of uh, and be a, a, an efficient means to fight off attempts at propaganda is interesting to me because it kind of connects the study of propaganda to study of populism because some people argue that we need some sort of left-wing populism, etc. I think that are, there are kind of pro tanto moral reasons uh, to uh, resist uh, th this idea. Uh, I think that there's something that, uh, that, that may be wrong with just trying to undercut uh, an agent's ration, rational agency by uh, not trying to really inform this person, but really trying to kind of produce uh, induce an effect on, on, on this agent. Now, I'm not committed to the principle that in all circumstances, propaganda is always going to be uh, uh, illegitimate. If you could show me that in specific situations, using propaganda is going to lead to sig a significantly better uh, uh, situation, maybe I would be inclined to, uh, to, uh, to agree with you, but I just think that uh, uh, one has to be uh, careful make, 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 when making such um, Distinctions. I have to say, I'm not perfectly understood how uh, my endorsement of uh, Neil Levy's critique, which is a critique that I endorse, uh, really undercuts my kind of ideal typic distinction between uh, cognitive, <laughs> affective, and cognitive propaganda. But I will try to give an example of what I would take would be kind of purely cognitive uh, propaganda, even though we, we rarely encounter it in the real world. It would be some sort of kind of uh, fake news article that really presents himself uh, as a being sci scientifically informed and does not try to kind of arouse specific feelings uh, in, uh, in, in uh, subjects, but I think your comment, I think your critique is fair on this point, because I do think that if you read a lot of, of, uh, of fair news, uh, uh, fake news articles, sorry, um, they, they really kind of uh, try to, re to, to rely on the fact that they're going to arise specific emotions, and then of course there's also psychological findings that uh, lead to the idea that we are inclined to remember information that arouse strong feelings. Is that so? Um, so I think I'll take this point. I think it's a, it's a, fairly, a fairly good comment. So deliberation, uh, deliberation is it good? Uh, is it a good way to uh, to reach the truth? Note that I'm not committed to the claim that deliberation will not improve. Uh, people's political knowledge generally. I'm not even committed to the claim that we should not try to implement kind of instances of, of uh, uh, we should not try Im to implement more uh, a more deliberative or participatory type of democracy. I just think that it's not going to be enough, that it's not going to work in uh, all cases. I think Fishkin and Laskin have a good case to show that it does lead to uh, a certain increase in political knowledge, uh, but I'm, uh, I'm uh, un unconvinced that, uh, that uh, it can work in um, in all the cases, and then finally, uh, really quickly, do I still have a minute? Yeah. Uh, okay. For the preventive uh, sanctioning stuff. Uh, so I'll admit that this part of the paper is a little bit uh, rough. It's a little bit messy. A lot more need, we need to be said to make a convincing case against the the uh, the. Um, the prevention uh, or sanctioning. So the idea that it's not even prevention, uh, okay, uh, but it, it would prevent some uh, readers to read uh, these stories. And then if you want to label it sanctioning, then I guess that I would respond by saying, okay, I would endorse the sanctioning strategy instead okay. of a preventive strategy. So it's just a question of label. But I do think that your critique was uh, was underlined by the fairly serious, uh, serious point um, uh, that it may be anti-democratic. Now, I don't see exactly how anti-democratic it would be to have a corporation to be forced to kind of remove certain sort of, of, of uh, articles uh, uh, after, uh, after a certain amount of time. I mean, the people would still be able to post it. Uh, they can basically say, uh, Facebook is basically already doing that with other kind of contents, the content that's trying to, to be uh, offensive. 
Um, so, but I think uh, I think you're right. I think that uh, the case for the legitimacy of such uh, of such measures uh, need to be uh, a little bit stronger. That more work need to be done. And the question is the question for me, and I try to tackle this towards the end of the article. Can can this strategy be understood to be a violation of free speech? Uh, and I think honestly, I think that like uh, I would need another paper to kind of discuss specifically that. Um, I, I just I just thought that um, uh, it's a little bit difficult to kind of jump into this kind of normative argument about propaganda without making some distinctions uh, in an article such as this one to just try to show what it is and why we should care about it. I just think it would be a bit weird, but um, I'll stop here uh, for the video q but thank you very much. Those are uh, very uh, helpful comments. Okay, thank you. So now we have a comment by Hélène, then Gloria. Uh, okay, thank you very much. I really enjoyed the paper. I also enjoyed the, the trichotomy and the, the distinction between different types of propaganda. I have a question about the kind of model of democracy you have in mind. It seems to be a very simple, you know, um, garbage in, garbage out kind of model. So if you have false beliefs, you know, it's going to have very bad consequences. But I, I, from my perspective, like the, the great, um, I mean, one of the benefits of the epistemic term, if you will, is to look at, at, at democracy as a system of, you know, dynamic and strategic interactions and uh, between voters, uh, representatives, and, and you know, so so. It could be, and I'm not saying that's the case, but it could be that you have those effects of propaganda on the beliefs of voters, and then at, at, the, at the output end of the story, nothing happens, or you could have potentially good, good mm -hmm. outcomes, because there's this black box in the middle, the, the representative part, or the deliberation part, or where maybe some of that is neutralized. Or, so I think it, I, I would like a justification as to why you stick to the Russian choice theory model of Brennan, so you know, yeah. those guys. When in fact it's very um, uh, simplistic and, and, and I don't think very accurate. Um, or, or do you choose that because in fact you're really only interested in the quality of the input and in fact whether or not the consequences are bad, you're just interested in making people uh, individually get closer to the truth, regardless of the. Yeah, uh, so I think, uh, of course, like, uh, I, I don't think that there's a broad model of, of democracy that's advocated in the paper. It's true that I focus on a very specific uh, uh, specific uh, phenomena. Um, I guess at one point it becomes a question of, of uh, confidence in the fact that other kind of uh, strategies may uh, may really weed out, like, the kind of, uh, of false belief, and, and that uh, after deliberation or other kind of mechanisms that one may have in mind, uh, it may turn out uh, to be the case that, well, actually, those false beliefs that are propagated by fake news are propaganda are not going to be that influential and then people are still going to be able to, to make a sound normative uh, uh, judgments. Um, I, I think it's it's interesting. I think at, at, at this point it really becomes a matter of kind of studying what really happens at, at the level of deliberation. And I, I know that of course you you are, are, are doing that. I would say that I've been, I've been influenced a little bit uh, for instance by like Tally Mendelsberg uh, work uh, that, that tried to show that sometimes when you get people to, to deliberate and you try to make them agree on specific normative proposal by uh, exchanging information, uh, sometimes it just doesn't work. And people it, it can uh, people can end up being very divided and it, it, they just uh, can't agree. But I want to kind of stress the idea that I'm certainly not close to the idea of deliberative mechanisms that can make the, the, the democracy better. It's really not a... It was not a it's a, forget about deliberation. Yeah. I'm just yeah. saying something happens among representatives. Yeah. They, they, they themselves will react to the level of ignorance in the public right. in ways that are not fixed. And, and all those models assume fixed uh, behavior among representatives, it's a, it's a big mistake. Right. So I, you may not care, but I think it's something you could have some, some, some Okay. Okay, so, so I, your suggestion would be, if I understand you, that, at the rep, that there would be something that would happen at a representative level that would kind of cancel but out the effects. The, the effect of propaganda on, on voters is one thing, yeah. but then the yeah. consequences on, on what representatives do and think yeah. in reaction to this effect, we don't know enough about. And assuming that you know, because you, 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 you corrupt the input, you're going to have a bad output without knowing something about what's going yeah. on in the middle, it's too simple. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks. I think I'll, I'll be short, and I think I think that you're right, and I should uh, look a bit more into that. But uh, thanks, a great suggestion. Laurie, I want to. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you, Etienne. I, uh, I, uh, I thought your paper was terrific, and, and it really it opens uh, raises questions that uh, are uh, uh, very 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 central for 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 this conference uh, about the epistemic requirements. Uh, on citizen beliefs, but also about the epistemic requires on, on uh, public uh, public discourse, and but I want to uh, and also I have to uh, 
uh, say that I have a little bit free reading on your paper because I didn't finish mine, so I, I mentioned your paper in mine, so I thank you a lot. I great input too. And so, but I want to uh, just comment, uh, and probably my comments are very close to what uh, okay. Elaine just said. Uh, one is uh, exactly. Um, <laughs> As you may know, I mean, uh, the, the work of Jason Stanley, who I'm quite familiar with, uh, is a way of importing some sort of paranoid uh, <laughs> uh, reflections that come from critical theory yes. to uh, political theory and sure. epistemology. It, it's, it, he is our Zizek, in a sense. I mean, <laughs> like making Zizek serious, I mean, taking Zizek serious. <laughs> Style, we are living in a total uh, propaganda hegemony, uh, like my friends, Balibar, all these guys from uh, Paris that uh, now are stars in New York, etc. And we are living in an hegemony, etc. Well, and then that is right. Maybe they are right. We are living in an hegemony, and uh, I buy this because there is a propaganda, and I'm a zombie, and I compete. But still, uh, on the consumer's uh, outcome, we're still quite rational beings. I mean, if this costs uh, like 2,000 euros and I have another one on another <coughs> website at 500 euros, I would probably buy the one at 500 euros. So uh, propaganda didn't basically uh, uh, disrupt uh, markets. So why are we sure that now propaganda uh, is going to disrupt, uh, for example, democracy. Uh, there is something here to tackle. There is an issue to tackle. I mean, and also, yeah. as you know, it is a, uh, there are many people who really just deny the fact that we are in a propaganda that these kinds of things or like fake beliefs, uh, etc., are instance of a propaganda because uh, if you raise the question of propaganda, you, of course, you have to raise the question of free speech yeah. and uh, uh, to what extent people are free to say things. And why you are proposing in the end a sort of a, um, um, extension or a, a preventive framework aren't the laws that we have. I, I, I'm, I'm not so competent in legal matters, but I think, for example, in France you have laws against, for example, uh, racist uh, discourse and no obligations. Yeah. So, uh, uh, can we just, uh, uh, can we uh, stick with our liberal uh, frameworks uh, and uh, uh, and then I think that tomorrow we will go on the discussion because uh, I will try also to distinguish some cases yes. from others. I think that there have been cases of new instances of propaganda in the in the last uh, campaign that really can harm. Them. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, yeah, I do think that you're a little bit more optimistic than, than, than me, but uh, but it's uh, uh, it's true that uh, it's 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 important to kind of not give in to this kind of like catastrophic way of thinking that we're all living in the post-truth era and then we cannot make uh, rational uh, decisions uh, uh, anymore. I do think that I, I mean I'm a little bit uh, uh, more skeptical than you about the kind of lack of effect that like uh, publicity or just ads uh, may may have on uh, on the way we uh, we 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 in it's in this case is also interesting because uh, I deliberately avoided to talk about like uh, propaganda for commercial purposes in the article but I think that uh, maybe one could one could push that uh, according to my definition of propaganda and I would be forced to consider it a specific form of ads uh, count as a form of, 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 of uh, uh, propaganda um, I feel in a way it's it's always a little bit uh, difficult to respond uh, I mean at least at this stage of, of the paper to, to kind of question because I think that the, really the, the good way to kind of try to assess whether or not we should be optimistic or not about uh, about the the lack of effects of propaganda is really to study kind of specific instances in which we can show uh, that either really uh, some ads really did have an effect on, uh, on people virus added or did not uh, have an effect so um, so that would be to, to when, when, with regards to commercial propaganda. Um, I think it's interesting when, when uh, you speak from a European perspective maybe mentioning can't we just stick to our laws uh, that we have uh, presently Potentially, I mean, uh, in a way, Germany is is uh, is uh, staying close to the kind of approach it has uh, it has had to free speech uh, for for a couple of decades. Uh, but there are a lot of important differences uh, between different countries, and especially between uh, uh, European countries and a North American country like um, like. Um, 
the United States. Uh, and I think the, the, the idea is that um, uh, in, in the US, you, you're gonna, uh, it's more likely that you're gonna have this kind of discourses according to which uh, it's always absolutely illegitimate to stop uh, somebody from, from saying uh, from, uh, from, well, I mean, that maybe yeah, to put it a little bit too strong, but uh, there, that, there, um, that there's few cases in which it's, it's legitimate to uh, kind of restrict who stop an individual from making a specific um, um, uh, statement. Um, I think uh, Brett Schneider would argue that in, 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 uh, in value democracy. And I think my, my main question would be, okay, but is it effective to kind of have uh, to, to have a system in which uh, would you just let people uh, uh, speak and then you, uh, you try to cancel out the effects after potentially, potentially, potentially not. Um, um, and again, um, uh, but Andre was, was kind of pushing the, this idea, so uh, I, I don't tend to consider that what I'm proposing is preventive measures is like some sort of hardcore censorship on what people can actually say. Uh, I, I feel the proposal, at the end of the very fairly modest, is to stop an organization from, uh, is to force an organization to buy financially for it, for forcing it, who doesn't disincentivize an organization to just <laughs> let kind of uh, specific kinds of fake new articles who may lead the people to believe uh, false things and may arouse hostility about vulnerable groups. Um, so um, I, I, I see the warning, uh, but I think that it's going to be a question at the very specific policy that you propose. And I think that in a way, this, 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 this uh, is, is fairly benign. You could push saying that it may not be enough if that's what you want to do. And, and, uh, and then the effects are not going to be efficient. And then again, we, we'll have to see uh, what happens in, in, in the, the German case. So sorry, I'm responding a little bit uh, too long to questions. I'll try to. Yeah. Um, can we take uh, uh, just Lance and uh, Kevin's comments uh, together? Okay, and then you respond to them. Wait. To them. Okay, just now. All right, thank you. Merci, Etienne. Uh, so that uh, looks like a great, uh, great paper. I'm looking forward to reading it. Um, I share some of the skepticism toward uh, Stanley's book. Maybe not to Berria's level, <laughs> but uh, I, I also yeah. share some of the skepticism. But it um, seems to me that one of the interesting concepts in the book is this notion of, of uh, undermining propaganda, which is a particular yeah. type of propaganda. And it seems to me that maybe you make it, it a bit too easy for yourself by focusing so much on hate speech or hate propaganda. Right? right. Because supportive propaganda is when democratic ideals are co-opted, uh, uh, but in a way that in the end will undermine them. You know? it's just like how sometimes like secularism or laissez-faire is being used to curtail the rights of some uh, citizens, or uh, right. when it talks about national identity or equality, fairness, and so on. Uh, so this is undermining propaganda because it, uh, it, it, it claims to uh, be, the discourse claims to be grounded on, on such democratic values, but in the end it will undermine them. And that seems to me that it's a kind of discourse that we witness in our uh, societies today, which is, and it's a, it's a much more subtle form of propaganda than hate propaganda. It seems to me that hate propaganda, uh, and, and then I share your position, should be uh, Ban. I know it's it's controversial in the in the literature, and, but uh, you know most countries have in the hate speech uh, laws because of the harm that hate speech yeah. uh, uh, do. And I saw very much on on, on Waldron's side uh, there. So, yeah. But that's how we can attack that, that problem problem. But it doesn't give us any means to fight against uh, undermining much more subtle uh, propaganda. So I was wondering where you are in your uh, thought on, on this. Uh, uh, we we oh, take yeah, the other question. Right. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I think uh, I, I have not read just Jason Stanley's book, um, but I am a reader of the sort of empirical literature in American politics on right. the dynamics of public opinion and political communication. And uh, coming from this pr direction, um, I, what, I, I don't see the distinction, if there is one, between yeah. propaganda and persuasion. Um, mm -hmm. So this, that whole literature simply doesn't use uh, the term persuasion because one man's persuasion is another man's propaganda. It's completely... Yeah. It's just a polemical concept. It has no conceptual usefulness at all. Um, and I wonder what you would say to that perspective. You don't, you don't address it anywhere in the paper. Um, and this is obviously hugely problematic for uh, you know, a project talk, focusing on propaganda. Yeah. If it's not a useful category, and if we're talking about persuasion, then we end up needing to think about useful uses of, of certain kinds. Then we're, then we're just not talking about propaganda. We're talking about yeah. the dynamics of persuasion and, and deliberation. Um, so I, I just have one other thing about um, false beliefs, and this is a little bit in the in the spirit of uh, Alain's uh, comment. But do false beliefs matter if uh, they don't matter for people's votes? Like, what if? Uh, yeah. So two things. One thing is uh, you say several times that like 
if the individual faces the task of determining whether the government should try to reduce carbon emissions, if she should decide whether or not the United States should invade a foreign country, those aren't the decisions citizens are asked to make. They vote. They're asked to vote. Yeah. Um, and so uh, it, it seems like a lot of the time, right, elections are big, complicated things. Yeah. People have false beliefs. But do we have any reason to think that for the things that people think are actually important, that they have false beliefs about them? You mentioned the possibility of people uh, having caring a lot about foreign policy and voting yeah. on that basis and having false beliefs about it. There is no, as far as I'm aware, I'm kind of up on this, uh, that there's no evidence that that's the case. Um, if there is evidence. Evidence about what specifically? Sorry, I missed. Uh, the idea that people are ignorant of things that they claim to care about. OK. So uh, I, I, I would be very surprised yeah. if that's the case. And I, there's definitely no evidence that. I OK. Thanks. So I think I'll answer in order, uh, Jocelyn, and then uh, Kevin's comment. Thank you. Um, so, um, uh, why do I situate myself with supporting with uh, Stanley's definition of supporting propaganda and undermining uh, propaganda? One problem I have with uh, uh, Stanley's definition is that I, I find it very difficult to actually distinguish between uh, uh, these two cases. So, in a lot of examples that he would give, uh, I, I would I would think that he was quite simply um, uh, talking about supporting propaganda, but then turns out that he says he's actually uh, talking about undermining propaganda. And one of the reason is that it defines uh, undermining propaganda as a speech that uh, presents itself as embodying a specific ideal but end up eroding it. Uh, and I think that uh, if you, you push this kind of vision a little bit, then it seems that any kind of, of, of a speech seems to fit this undermining definition of propaganda, including the cases of su supporting propaganda that he's giving. So I think that that's kind of the main uh, uh, objection I, I had to this. Um, the idea would be it's a little bit uh, over-inclusive, and I think some... Uh, some reviews of the book have also argued that uh, his definition of uh, undermining propaganda uh, can be a little bit um, um, uh, undermining, uh, uh, if you consider, uh, sorry, under-inclusive, uh, if you consider that there are some cases of, of, of uh, propaganda and fake news articles that don't really seem uh, to present themselves at the embodiment of an ideal, but just try to kind of straightforwardly uh, misinform uh, uh, the public. So that's why I'm kind of inclined to, to reject um, uh, uh, to, re to, to reject his account. I want to stress again uh, that, well, I mean, it, it ties to uh, to uh, propaganda and persu persuasion, and, and, and I think the, the, this is a, a very good question and a, a, a great comment. Can we really distinguish propaganda from, from uh, persuasion? Uh, I guess the question would be, uh, certainly not all instances of propaganda you can really distinguish from, from uh, persuasion, and that may, be, may, that may actually be a reason to kind of try to, to narrow or tailor down the, the definition or to, to modify it a little bit. Uh, as you signed the paper, I mainly considered about, uh, a concern about deliberate attempts to kind of misinform uh, the public. And by misinform, I'm just mind kind of propagating false descriptive beliefs about how the world is, and, it, and it's not really. And it seems to me, so cognitive propaganda is really what I'm interested in. Maybe I should just focus on that, uh, because I think that if not, you're right. You can say, really, is it really, is it really different? Uh, the question is that um, would, would would you also consider persuasion to be uh, to include such kind of cases? Uh, if so, then I would agree that uh, that uh, maybe uh, maybe maybe they're more similar. Uh, but I wasn't sure that uh, uh, at least, um, and you know this literature more than mine, and. Uh, it's, it's nice discussing it with you, actually, but uh, uh, it's unclear to me what exactly how political scientists define persuasion, but there's certainly some work uh, to be done there. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I don't know if I answer your question. Uh, it, yeah? Okay. So now, uh, Kristen and Dominic. Yeah, so I, um, I, was, I was very sympathetic to your uh, conclusion, but I wondered how well it really responds to the problem you're yeah. uh, concerned with. So you focused a lot on empirical, factual beliefs. So yes, whether or not immigration increases the, the crime rate, or whether it, you know, Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. But those kinds of empirical beliefs by themselves don't give you any policy conclusions at all, right? So yeah. there is an extra step you have to make from uh, immigration increases the crime rate to we should be closing our borders. Yeah. Uh, and that, you know, there's certain normative assumptions that you're making about right. you know, how to weigh our interests versus the interests of the people who would be immigrants. Uh, and how much weight we can give to, you know, risks or perceived risks that we're going to be subject to versus what's at stake for the people who might be uh, immigrating. So, so my concern is partly that you're sort of misidentifying the problem in the empirical belief when actually it's the normative Some commitments sort of, yeah. that are the problem. And then some, so, and equally, if you're responding by just saying, 
know that this is false, actually immigration does not increase the crime rate, you're sort of implicitly, you're, fa you're failing to address what I think is actually a more important concern, which is the normative assumptions that are being made about how much weight we can give to you know, our interests versus the interests of, of would-be immigrants or refugees or whatever it might be. Yeah. So, you know, by saying instead, you know, I think by saying, oh, yeah. this is a false belief, if this is not actually true, we're sort of saying, oh yeah, the normative judgment is right. So yes, if, you know, if the crime were, were going to go up because of immigration, then yes, we should be closing the borders. But yeah. the factual belief is wrong, so we should not be closing the borders. And that, that, that really worries me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, yeah. He agrees. So, thank you. Two points. My first point was about positive uh, propaganda. Well, the propaganda or propaganda that plays a, so a useful social role. So, if we think, for instance, of uh, environmental, the kind of propaganda that uh, right. environmental advocacy groups are doing. So, I was not exactly sure how that would fit in your system, but we, you've touched that a couple of times already. Right. My, my second point was about the effect of deliberative democracy on fake news or cognitive pro propaganda. Okay. So, there's a fair amount of empirical evidence out there that uh, deliberation may create a phenomenon of polarization in a group. So that's a point that people like Cass and Steve what? have been yeah. making for a long, long time. I think you all the polarization. No, in almost all his books and, and many papers. Uh, so what could be happening when you have deliberation is that propaganda would first uh, slightly shift people's uh, belief or uh, emotions or, or conceptions of the world in, in a direction. And then through deliberation and that phenomenon of polarization, it would consolidate their, their, their position in a way that is more extreme and more crystallized and even stronger in the direction that we don't want to. Yeah. So I was wondering if you have considered that and what you would have to say on, the, on this polar, polarizing uh, I, I'll answer to, to this one very easily. So I, I, I think I don't need to disagree with you. Like, I mean, I, mean, I, mean, I, I, I share your skepticism. This is, this is, uh, this is, right. I, I, this is what I tried to do in the two last two parts of the paper uh, because there are concerns with, with, uh, with uh, specific, uh, with the way deliberation actually proceeds. And it's true that, um, I mean, I read uh, Sunstein, but I don't, I don't talk about it directly in the, in the paper. There are reasons to, to believe that it's not, uh, it's not uh, exactly going to be like I think that's that's why uh, Hélène Landmore was pushing me a little bit on the kind of representative mechanism because it's true that the representative mechanism there I really I don't uh, consider the paper and I think it would be worth, worth it to do it but I I, I, I agree with you um, what what was your first question it was about the de desirable uh, propaganda. Yeah. Propaganda yeah, so I think my answer is going to be similar to the one I gave to to Andre. If you, can, I think that there are, are uh, prima facie reasons to kind of uh, re resist the idea that it's okay, morally okay, to just try to propagate false beliefs to kind of uh, misinform the public. Uh, but uh, but I think that these are basically non consequentialist con consequentialist reasons, uh, not necessarily epistemic reasons. But at the same time, uh, I, I'm not committed to the claim that. All cases of, of uh, that in all situations, there's some sort of normative anti-propaganda principle that every time somebody proposes a, pro a propaganda measure, uh, then then uh, we should resist it. If you if you tell me that like we can successfully uh, make like significantly improve the the, uh, the environmental situation by using some sort of, of, of propaganda, maybe is it the best way to do it? Uh, well, I mean, possibly, but yeah. Uh, but I want. Uh, should I st should I stop or should I respond to Kristen to, to, yeah. to Kristen and well we, we're running out of time so uh, Seb, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry we, uh, we'll continue this uh, discussion around the, <laughs> yeah. the lunch <laughs> so uh, um, and, and Jason it's you, you have just one minute to to uh, uh, do you have a minute yeah, um, uh, because he was okay. uh, waiting for okay. a long time so, the, uh, then, uh, and. Christine. Your answer to, to Christine. Uh, after, after or before Jason? No. Okay. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's a good point. That's kind of a, like a, a rehabilitation of the fact value distinction, right? right? That's not because we, we believe a specific factual belief that you're going to necessarily endorse a uh, normative assumption. I just find it hard to believe that uh, kind of descriptive assumptions that are the kind that uh, some people who engage or propaganda really try to propagate are going to have no effect or not going to have uh, uh, an effect on, on, on what people believe. I think that if you look at the history of propaganda and give slightly more more historical examples, uh, the, act, the attempt to just describe certain groups of the population as actually being less intelligent or uh, having less capacity, I think it led, it, it did have an impact in kind of shaping the normative belief that it was kind of okay to treat 
uh, to treat these groups better. So I think you're right. There's absolutely no necessary connection between the descriptive belief and then a normative judgment. But I don't think we should pretend like there's kind of no connection. I think that most of our normative yeah, judgments really non-free speech situations in which you cannot reply. Yeah. I mean, the, the, there were the, the propaganda of insects, uh, Jewish as insects, is in, in a, in a non-free speech situation. Yeah. Uh, the opposite. Uh, so the idea would be. Reply yeah. And say, so no, then the idea that. that, that the not yeah. the Jews. So then the idea would be that in liberal democratic yeah. councils yeah. there would be some exactly. some some mechanism. Yeah. Uh, uh, possibly. Okay. So, just so very quickly, uh, I have a question about what you think the nature of the perniciousness of appeals to emotion to influence judgment are. So what I have in mind is say, take these two contrast cases, yeah. one involving a factually true story about a refugee who's a rapist, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. mm -hmm. And so there's, there's, it's not fake news, it's a true story, but it's yeah. trying to get people around this view that you know, we ought to stop immigration, versus the role that the photographs of the drowned boy, Alan Curdy, had in yeah. changing people's views about our moral obligations towards Syrian refugees, yeah. um, and you can, you know, the, and the use of those in yeah. bringing people around to change their, their their normative views about our moral obligations to refugees. So those are both sort of kind of appeals to emotion. Are they both kinds of propaganda on your view? Are they both things that um, we ought to address in some way? Yeah, um, I think yeah, uh, it, it's interesting. It's a it's a it's a tough case, but I think uh, they could be. I mean, I think that uh, with the definition of like uh, the part of effective propaganda definition that I have, I would have to accept that both cases are, are cases of propaganda. Which doesn't mean that I have to consider that they're necessarily necessarily, necessarily sorry, I tend to speak too fast. Uh, uh, problematic. So my question would be, um, is it defamatory to portray somebody who actually? committed a crime as somebody who committed a crime. Um, I'm, I'm not sure it is, so the measure that I propose at the end of the paper is to kind of block some sort of defamatory form of, of propaganda. Uh, and it's certainly not defamatory to kind of uh, use pictures of the little boy who drowned. So uh, I find it, a, I, I, I mean, I don't think I would, I would have uh, uh, objections about it. I don't know if it fully, fully answers your, uh, your, your question. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Etienne. Thank you. Thank you all.